So Sam, you have a very rich CV. Please take us quickly through your background, starting with your name, and tell us how you arrived at sounding the alarm about biological research, which culminated in your piece in Salon. Um, my name is Sam Husseini. Um, I'm an independent uh, journalist. Um, a lot of my writing is at Husseini.org. I did a lot of work regarding uh, claims about Iraqi weapons of mass destruction before uh, the invasion of Iraq and indeed throughout the 1990s about false claims um, demonizing Iraq and um, false claims about uh, the existence of Iraq WMDs. Um, and um, I occasionally go to news conferences and ask tough questions. In 2011, I, um, uh, when the Arab uprisings happened and the um, desire for change uh, was being perverted by um, Saudi Arabia and other governments, I questioned a Saudi official at the press club asking him what the legitimacy of the Saudi regime was. I got suspended from the press club um, for that, and that was later overturned by the um, ethics committee there. Um, in 2018, I attempted to question uh, uh, Trump and Putin at their uh, summit in Helsinki about the nuclear weapons ban treaty and got uh, dragged out. Um, here's, there? looks like uh, there's some... Oh, dear. What is this, fisty Some sort of a skirmish. Uh, oh, my. Someone what was holding up heck? a sign. Last year, I covered the um, uh, plowshares trial in Georgia of uh, activists who went on a U.S. main Trident military nuclear base. Um, so I followed uh, nuclear issues, um, other uh, weapons of mass destruction issues, uh, politics in general, but especially foreign policy. How did you get to the article that you wrote in Salon? What inspired you to write it? On February 11th, the CDC had a, uh, a, a news conference, or the press club had a news conference with a CDC official. Um, and I try to go to these things and try to ask what, uh, as best I can, a tough question, uh, sort of the question that's, you know, the elephant in the room that no one wants to talk about. And I asked about the lab in, in Wuhan. Sam Husseini from Consortium News. Uh, obviously the main concern is how to stop the virus and death and so on, but I, I think that we should look into the origins of this. Is, is it the CDC's contention that there, there's absolutely no relation to the BSL-4 lab in uh, Wuhan? The, the temp, it's my understanding this is the only place in China with a BSL-4 lab. Uh, BSL-4, that's the highest level lab with the most deadly pathogens and allegedly the most stringent safety requirements. We in the United States have, I, I think, two dozen or so um, and there have been problems and incidents. Some of them have been shut down out of concerns of leakage of uh, potential pathogens. Um, and it's an ethical struggle in the United States about gain of function research. That is research that actually attempts to make pathogens more lethal. Um, and China is a very opaque society, a totalitarian regime. We have no idea, or I don't know, you tell me, do you have any idea what kind of research uh, could potentially be done? I'm not contending that this was intentional in any way. I'm just asking, is, is it a complete coincidence that this outbreak happened in the one city in China with a BSL-4 lab, and shouldn't we be having at least some of the discussion about the ethics of some of the research that happens here? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for those comments. Um, Based on everything that I know about what is going on with this outbreak and the research that's being conducted, as well as the genomic um, sequences that have been posted and the comparison with um, animal strains, this, um, the pattern that we're seeing is, is quite consistent with emergence from animal to human uh, acquisition. I, I followed up and I said, uh, you know, being of quote unquote natural origin doesn't necessarily preclude that it didn't come from the lab. Uh, that is, they could have collected it in nature. Um, the caves, the bat caves that people point to are over a thousand miles away from Wuhan. Um, and she had the most striking response to me, which I've heard elsewhere. In the midst of new infections, it is very common for rumors to emerge, 
that can take on a life of their own. So as you mentioned, a laboratory and, and the center of, of what else is happening in that province, I'm reminded of um, concerns we heard when, when I was in Sierra Leone in, in 2014 with the Ebola response. There was a concern that there was a hemorrhagic virus research center in Sierra Leone, and maybe that's where the virus had come from. It was a, a key rumor that had to be overcome in order to help control the outbreak. So based on everything that I know right now, I can tell you the circumstances of the, the origin really look like animal to human. Um, but your question, um, I, I heard. It, it struck me as an incredibly defensive answer meant to shut down a legitimate line of inquiry uh, rather than a forthright answer. In terms of the um, question about gain of function research and laboratory issues, very important for us as a um, scientific community to have uh, practices that protect researchers and their laboratory workers as well as the community around them and that we um, use science for the benefit of um, people. So I am closely involved in this response and everything that I've seen so far is very consistent with the animal to human spread that we've seen in other um, zoonotic origin. I was still focusing on the narrow questions about the election at that point, uh, but I started digging further and further into it and it culminated ultimately with the fir my first salon piece. We are being generally assured from many quarters that there's no reason to believe this virus is anything other than a quote-unquote zoonotic pathogen from a food market in China. Others, including U.S. administration officials recently, have hinted at the possibility that this was an accidental release from a lab in Wuhan. I is there any reason to be confident that these are the only two explanations? I don't think those are the only two explanations. I think that there are three plausible explanations, and I think that people making claims on different sides might have ulterior motives. And I, I, I wouldn't believe the Wuhan lab explanation simply because um, uh, uh, government officials say so. That, that to me does not necessarily increase the you know, veracity of, of that explanation. You don't have a particular interest in pinning this on China, right? You don't think this is like an actionable thing, we should be going to war with China. You're not arguing that. Not you at all. I, I, I think that part of many people who are saying things like that, um, primarily in the U.S. right, like uh, Tom Cotton, uh, but also Democrats as well. Uh, Chris Murphy uh, uh, put out a letter basically fingering uh, the lab in Wuhan. And w when Cotton does it, it's particularly vociferous and talking about the secrecy of these Chinese labs and how dangerous they are, and explicitly saying how in contrast to our labs, which are open and trying to uh, create vaccines to benefit humanity and so on. And I, I think that that's totally wrong. The, 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 the lab work that's done, um, this kind of lab work is dangerous, whether it's done in a Chinese lab or a US lab, um, and indeed, um, uh, the U.S. U.S. policy has driven this 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 arms race. I mean, it's possible um, that China, you know, the Chinese lab slipped on a banana peel here, but in part they slipped on a banana peel in a race that w was orchestrated by U.S. policy. A as I see it, there are three explanations. One is it had nothing to do with a lab, which I hesitate to say came from nature because, um, you know, that could mean uh, that ultimately the causes are animal farming, deforestation, and so on. But let, let's just broadly say that had nothing to do with any lab. The other is that it was an accidental release from one of the labs. There are actually two. I didn't know that when I questioned the CDC initially. There are two labs in Wuhan um, and uh, an accidental release there. And those accidents happen, including at U.S. labs. It's a you know, long and documented history that I... Um, at least, you know, give a, you know, a, a rough outline of in my recent articles. Um, and the third one is that it, it was designed to, um, in effect, frame uh, the labs in, in Wuhan. This would be akin to the, what happened with the anthrax attacks. Uh, people might remember after 9-11, letters were sent in the mail uh, with, you know, death to America, praise to Allah. Uh, written on them to uh, members of Congress, to members of the media. Um, it sent a wave of panic throughout 
the United States. People were afraid to open their mail. Um, it made people um, incapable, uh, in many cases, of rational thought as to what threats did or didn't exist. Um, and they um, ultimately were traced, um, to the extent that they were fully traced, to uh, uh, U.S. or U.S. allied labs. That is, the anthrax, the terrorists, um, uh, came from within the U.S. government. Um, so uh, that, that's what you would call an example of a false flag attack. It's a very prominent one. It was never meaningfully resolved. Um, even Leahy, uh, Senator Leahy, one of the targets of it, uh, it, you know, Mueller was head of the FBI in 2008, and when they finally said, you know, okay, we pinned it on this guy, Bruce Ivins, after they've tried to pin it on several other lone, lone wolves um, and had to pay one of them off uh, millions of dollars for their conduct, um, Leahy told Mueller, I'm not buying this story, uh, that it was all one guy. Uh, who did this. And there's a, a substantial body of work, um, a substantial amount of evidence that, that it wasn't simply um, one guy. While we're on that topic of the anthrax attacks, what resulted from the anthrax attacks? Yes, that, that, that's critical. Um, uh, after the 9-11 attacks, a lot of people felt very, in the United States, felt besieged and traumatized. And this was very adroitly exploited. Uh, by the Bush-Cheney administration, including the anthrax attacks. Uh, people uh, were beside themselves, un uh, afraid to open their mail. It's similar to the dynamic of you have here, of people being on edge in a, in a different sort of way, but it's, it's the closest parallel in, in many respects. Congress was suspended uh, uh, for a time, um, and uh, Bush admini Bush Cheney administration rammed the Patriot Act uh, so-called Patriot Act with draconian restrictions on civil liberties and so on uh, during that time and they also built up uh, their wars uh, against Afghanistan as well as against Iraq. You've worked for a number of progressive media outlets and media watchdog outlets like Fairness and Accuracy and Reporting but it seems there's a, a kind of a new sort of myopia from traditionally progressive venues where a number of issues related to the pandemic are concerned. One of these in particular is the possible laboratory origin of the coronavirus. What, what, do you, what explains this attitude? How has this been politicized? Um, I, I think part of the answer to that is the, the sort of dwindling of independent thought in left of center circles coming out of the Russia gate and then Ukraine gate situations where a lot of people just are so compulsively uh, quote-unquote anti-Trump that they aren't sorting out facts and seeing where um, where stories are coming from and who's pushing them and I, I think we saw significant sectors of uh, liberal and progressive media become in effect um, implements of the DNC as a result of that process and I think that it's been in sort of different quarters and in different ways, but similar. You, you have a process now where people are sort of reflexively saying, we don't want to do anything that will um, damage U.S.-China relations or will, that will be used by the pro-war um, uh, sections, especially of the U.S. right. Um, uh, in, in terms of uh, China relations. So I think that there, there's been a tremendous... And it, it doesn't make sense to me because, you know, it, it's an empirical question uh, to me. And I think that in certain quarters in the mainstream, there has been a hysterical attempt to squash the possibility that it had something to do with the lab. Um, and again, that something could be either it came out of the labs or they're being framed. Um, and I, I think that there's been an incredible lack of in inquisitiveness and honest inquiry on those questions across the political spectrum. So let's just get down to some of the basics. Um, what is gain-of-function research? And what, what, are, what is a biosafety level 3 or level 4 lab? Who runs them? Where are they? Sure. Um, gain-of-function research is something of a technical euphemism. It means that you're trying to make it more deadly. 
So you take a virus, for example, that is deadly but isn't airborne, and you make it so that it becomes airborne. So you have increased its functionality, you've increased its deadliness, and this is presumably a scientific accomplishment. The person who um, wrote the U.S. implementing legislation for the Biological Weapons Convention, uh, Francis Boyle, calls this criminal. Um, uh, a criminal enterprise. It's similarly uh, derided uh, by uh, an eminent scientist, Richard Ebright, at uh, Rutgers University. Um, and it's, there's been periodic concern, even in the mainstream literature, when a scientist in the Netherlands and another one at the University of Wisconsin in 2001 managed to use animal passages. That is, they took a virus and then forced it through several uh, ferrets. Ferrets have a respiratory system that's similar to humans. The New York Times had an editorial called An Engineered Doomsday. Their concern was uh, that it shouldn't be published because then e either through lab accident or the terrorists can get a hold of it. They're, again, they ignore the other option, which is what happened with anthrax, that, that it came out of the government. Um, so gain of function increases the lethality of um, pathogens uh, such, as, such as these viruses. And what are biosafety level three, two, three, four labs? What, uh, do, what do they do and where are they located? Um, well, um, th th there are probably hundreds of them. I believe that there are at least 70 uh, BSL-3 and BSL-4 labs in the United States. They are the highest with, uh, with the uh, allegedly the most stringent requirements in terms of airflow, uh, uh, suits that are worn, and so on. They are extremely expensive um, uh, facilities um, that deal with uh, deadly pathogens and do this kind of research. They exist increasingly all around the world. Um, I don't think that there exists a definitive list of them. I don't think that there exists uh, completely definitive um, requirements as to the conduct, although there, there's uh, certainly some guidelines. Um, uh, the ones that we know of are uh, government ones. Uh, Fort Detrick um, had an accident just last year. They ha have a new facility coming on line that's uh, apparently the most expensive and largest in the world. Um, uh, but th they're, they're, they're also corporate. They're, I'm sure that governments have some that are undeclared. Are there connections between the different uh, labs throughout the world? Um, there are, and sometimes it's a cause for concern. After there was some publicity to uh, accidental releases at the CDC facilities and other facilities in 2014, and after the Ebola outbreak in 2014, the U.S. stopped funding um, uh, this gain-of-function work, uh, the NIH did. But they made exceptions. Uh, one of the exceptions that they made involved uh, work done by the University of North Carolina and uh, the center, uh, the virology center in Wuhan, as well as Harvard University. Um, uh, and so, so there gain of function, uh, gain of function studies continued in those places. The gain of function studies continued, and there was never a ban on gain of function work. There was simply a pause in funding by the NIH of gain-of-function work, but there were even exceptions to that. Um, and the funding of the lab in Wuhan, uh, done uh, also with a USAID. And, and, but isn't NIAID, isn't Fauci's lab involved? Yes, they granted the exemption for the funding, but the actual money was through USAID, which is basically the State Department. Uh, as well as a group called EcoHealth Alliance. And this work was that kind of work, gain-of-functional work. So they, they worked with viruses, with the labs in Wuhan, with U.S. universities, in order to make deadly pathogens potentially more deadly, ostensibly to protect, to say, what are the curveballs that nature can throw at us so that we can be better prepared so that we can fight against them? What are the curveballs that the terrorists can throw at us so that we can be better prepared? That, that's the ostensible reason, but they've, as we've seen, totally failed in their ostensible purpose. They, they've succeeded in creating more deadly pathogens, but they haven't succeeded in uh, protecting us.
what is the Eco Health Alliance? It sounds the, very nice. It yeah, sounds right. very crunchy. Right, exactly. Um, that, that's the problem with these things. Uh, Eco Health Alliance uh, funded, among other things, this work in Wuhan. Um, uh, for, for example, they go to these bat caves, collect pathogens, uh, collect deadly things, and then take them to study them, and then they tinker with them. Uh, again, this is ostensibly to prevent a pandemic, but if the labs themselves become a transmission site through which they enter the human population, then they become an accelerant. Uh, they become the source of the problem. Um, Eco Health Alliance, uh, you know, funded um, uh, lab work in Wuhan and elsewhere. They have on their board. Uh, on their scientific advisory board of uh, for former longtime people, top people at Fort Detrick, for example, the U.S. Um, uh, main bio, quote unquote, defense bioweapons facility. Uh, they get major funding uh, from uh, Colgate Palmolive and Johnson & Johnson, uh, which have uh, various interests in deforestation, uh, as well as other factors that could be part of the, uh, the threat here. And in a way, by trying to find this lab solution to you know, deforestation and animal farming posing some threats, instead of scaling back um, uh, the, 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 those things, they are accelerating another thing, uh, this lab work, which could itself become uh, is, regardless of the cause of this pandemic, that work is a, a, a total threat. What is NIAID's role? What is uh, Tony Fauci's role in this? Well, um, to the extent that I've been able to determine it, um, there, there have been alarms raised by scientists for years. There was a letter in 2005 um, signed by over 700 uh, scientists to the NIH basically saying you're perverting our field here with all of this funding of all of this so-called biodefense um, uh, work. And biodefense is largely indistinguishable in many cases from biowarfare because you have to create the weapon in order to figure out how to defend against it is the logic as it goes. So they've in effect try to find this loophole, which we can get into around uh, the uh, legal constraints that should be preventing them from doing this kind of work. Um, so these 700 scientists put out this statement saying, especially since 9-11, since the anthrax tax, you're you know, perverting our field with all of this funding. And it was Fauci who responded to that at the time. Um, um, and he basically said, the uh, American people, uh, through their political leadership, that's the Bush-Cheney administration he's talking about, have told us that they want this work done. Now, it can either be done through the, the, completely through the Pentagon and other U.S. government agencies, or we can have a seat at the table. So we're going to have U.S. U.S. military agencies, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Uh, or, or even you know, uh, I mean, the other possibilities are either the CIA, um, or, or the black budget, or uh, the nuclear weapons labs are, are probably involved in this, or almost certainly involved in this as well. Um, so Fauci basically told these 700 scientists to put up or shut up, um, and this was the direction that um, that this um, scientific field was increasingly going to move into. And every year, there, there has been, uh, since 9-11, there's been at least $5 billion um, uh, spent on this quote-unquote bio uh, defense, generally. Now, I don't know how much of that is gain-of-function work, uh, but bio defense generally, th there's been, at minimum, $5 billion a year. Uh, a cardinal rule is stated goals are not actual goals in the political realm. They say that they want to do one set of things, protect the American public against the bad terrorists, when in fact their goals are geopolitical domination and so on. So I think that this is another instance of that. It's not hard to imagine that this would have created a kind of uh, bioweapons arms race. Absolutely. Uh, and and that, 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 that's totally key. The, the, the U.S. got around, uh, allegedly got around, 
uh, the Bioweapons Convention by saying we're doing this for defensive purposes. Th there, there are exemptions in the U.S. law that Francis Boyle wrote and the Bioweapons Convention, but they, the word defensive isn't in there. It says for peaceful purposes, as Professor Boyle will be very happy to emphasize that the law that he wrote does not have an exemption for defensive work for th exactly this reason. Um, so th they are, in, in a, you know, quite arguably violating it. But the U.S. did so brazenly. And of course, every other country, including China, including Russia, um, uh, including the U.K., uh, France are the main other countries doing it, Israel as well. But Israel never even signed the Bioweapons Convention. Um, so um, they, they all um, uh, got the message that, okay, we can do this exception to the Bioweapons Convention so we can get around it by just simply claiming that it's for defensive purposes. You know, there's sort of a scientific failure and there's been a media failure. For example, the, the president of EcoHealth Alliance was on Democracy Now! not too long ago. And this was, I, I believe, April 16th. And this was the first time that Democracy Now!, uh, ostensibly the premier um, flagship of progressive thought in the United States, shared with their, with their audience that, that there was a lab in Wuhan that could conceivably have been the cause of the pandemic. They had made one reference to it, I think on April 6th, that said, uh, that credited the lab with discovering the coronavirus, <laughs> but not ever saying. Um, and uh, the, the notion that the lab was the source was dismissed. Um, by USA Today, by the Washington Post, by all these outlets in very snarky, dismissive ways that uh, just simply revolt, that even predated but then echoed off a very narrow set of scientists who themselves are largely, uh, like EcoHealth Alliance, involved with this work and that want to dismiss any scrutiny in this area as rumors or a conspiracy theory or, you know, and that to me, it, it, it goes against science and legitimate inquiry and it goes against journalism. You mentioned a February 2020 letter to the medical journal Lancet. Can you describe its contents and who some of its authors were? Yeah, um, uh, th that letter was ostensibly um, uh, to show solidarity with the uh, workers in Wuhan, but it also had a phrase denouncing the conspiracy theories uh, as to the non-natural origin of, uh, of the pandemic. And again, it was an attempt to shut down debate. Um, and to me, th that, that's an totally empathetical to the scientific process. The scientific process should welcome um, scrutiny and debate. Uh, on, on serious questions like this, and then you, uh, you know, have you, you know, have a hypothesis, and you break the hypothesis, and you produce evidence and reasonable argument. Uh, they attempted to short circuit all of that by saying, "Oh, th th this is you know conspiracy stuff." One of the one of the signers of the Lancet le letter, uh, uh, Charles Kalisher, uh, the, the first one listed. They're listed alphabetically. Uh, several of them have questionable ties to the government. Um, his is perhaps the most notable. Um, he's been accused by the Cuban government of having spread by warfare agents in Cuba. The uh, dengue fever, was it? Correct. Um, he, he denies the charge, of course, but it's remarkable that, that, that that's out there. Um, and others have more subtle ties. Uh, Peter Daszak, who's the president of the EcoHealth Alliance, was one of the signatures. Um, other people um, uh, who are involved in biodefense, quote unquote, biodefense work, were among the signers. Um, it's quite notable that you have, among the loudest voices, uh, people who have some level of US government connection or um, uh, other questionable things in these in their background along these lines. Uh, trying to uh, shut among down Among the this loudest debate. voices denying the De possible denying lab work. Denying the origin. possibility that this had anything to do with any kind of lab work. You wrote about a piece in the journal Nature Medicine. Who is Robert Gary? Robert Gary is a very interesting character. He seems to keep popping up at politically convenient locations. He uh, 
happened to be in West Africa uh, doing lab work when the Ebola outbreak happened there. Um, uh, I found an interview with him um, with uh, James Carville, uh, the Democratic Party operative, um, about uh, the Ebola outbreak that was just remarkable uh, for one given by a scientist. It was basically um, talking about how we really needed to, um, you know, get, you know, t take care of this Ebola situation because the government uh, most affected by it was an ally of the United States, and therefore we needed to, you know, back them up because if this continued, then they might be destabilized. It was just a, a remarkable um, set of perspectives um, for uh, a scientist. Um, I mean, as opposed and, and to just saying we should be right, that they're dealing with this. Yeah, no it wasn't what. dealing in the realm of, uh, you know, uh, you know, caring for regular people, or or or, or that seemed secondary at best, um, or or you know, or just from a scientific perspective. He's also been noted uh, in his assorted roles by Dr. Merrill Nass, who's done leading work on the anthrax vaccines, uh, where she's noted that he keeps popping up in all of these situations that don't seem connected by a scientific interest. They all seem to be politically charged issues. Um, and Ed Hooper, who um, wrote The River, a book that um, alleges that the outbreak of HIV was because of a polio vaccine uh, that had gone wrong um, in Africa. Um, uh, that was well reviewed in the New York Times when it came out in 1999, I think. Um, he says that Robert Gary acted in completely bizarre fashion with him that, that seemed more akin to spook work when uh, Hooper was trying to um, study the origins of the AIDS, uh, uh, of the AIDS epidemic. Um, and uh, so several people have raised substantial questions uh, about his role as a scientist. And what, what did he, was he a part of this uh, article? What was the article in journal, in the, in the Nature Medicine Journal? Uh, it purported to say that this was not a laboratory, that the novel coronavirus is not a laboratory construct. Um, and, but it seemed to have done so simply by saying that it wasn't technically ge uh, um, genetically engineered. Um, but as many people have noted, that those two things are not the same. It can come out of a lab without necessarily being uh, genetically engineered. So it was a very disingenuous, at best, article, if not outright false. It, and then it was immediately picked up by all of these media outlets, USA Today, uh, ABC, Washington Post, so on and so forth, with, you know, it's the snarkiest headlines and you know, uh, th these scientists are getting tired of uh, debunking this crazy conspiracy theory, that, that entire... Yeah, it wasn't tone. ABC News headline, sorry, conspiracy theorists, right, there's no right. lab origin, okay? Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. A a ABC had that snarky headline, and then I can't remember, some other outlet said, the scientists are tired of debunking the, 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 these theories, the, you know. Um, and and you, you mentioned someone named Lori Garrett. Who is Lori Garrett, and what did she write? Yeah. She's very prominent on this issue. Um, she has written several books about potential pandemics. She used to be with the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, is she uh, a scientist? She's not a scientist. She's a journalist. She's a writer. Um, uh, uh, she uh, repeatedly, um, uh, and one time she did this outright, um, wants to blame um, quote unquote exotic animals for the outbreak. Um, and at one point, like uh, on the consumption of exotic animals, correct, uh, as that being the, the way that it went from bats to humans. Um, so um, it, it just seemed very odd to me that that's the constant refrain in these quarters. She's associated with um, Ian Lipkin um, uh, from Columbia University. They were both. Um, uh, special technical advisors to the movie Contagion that uh, millions, if not tens of millions of people have viewed, um, especially lately. And, it, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the movies depicts unregulated lab work 
uh, at a BSL-3 as a heroic enterprise that helps to stop the contagion. And um, it depicts the CDC is, you know, led by very caring, uh, although flawed, uh, individuals. Um, it depicts the army fairly positively, and indeed it gives uh, thanks to the, uh, uh, the Pentagon as well as uh, the CDC. And it was funded by the state of Georgia, which is where the CDC um, is located. What, what's the overall impression one gets from contagion? The overall impression that one gets from contagion is that unregulated lab work can be heroic um, and that um, the uh, threat is uh, deforestation and animal farming um, and, um, uh, and animals, you know, that, that bats, that, that's how the movie ends. It's transmitted from a bat to a pig um, that a chef touches and then he shakes hands with an American woman who jumps on a plane and heads to the United States and that's how the outbreak uh, fundamentally begins. But, but I interestingly, what, we, what we've been learning from virologists and what I'm sure you've been seeing in your work to actually make the leap from just a pig to a bat to a human, it requires much more gain of function than just that. To, to do that sort of thing, we've, been, we've discovered it take, might take hundreds of years for, a, for it to kind of happen naturally, but, but it's, the, it's just the sort of work that's being done in these labs to artificially create that situation, which may not even ever happen ordinarily. The thing that we can't avert our eyes from is that it effectively accelerates the existence and the proximity to humans of the threat. And these, in, in other words, th some of the threats that they've developed might never have naturally occurred had they not done the work. Correct. That's my understanding. That they, they, they are out to look for enemies, ostensibly for the purpose of figuring out how to defeat them. And sounds like a that's common. A, that's at best a very dangerous thing. I mean, you have Richard Ebright, an, an, an eminent scientist. And he calls this kind of work that they do, going to these um, caves and, he, he says it's not science, it's Indiana Jones adventurism. It's the definition of insanity, um, he calls it. And you, you hear that phrase quite a bit. A, a former um, head of the Royal Scientific Society in 2014 called this, this kind of work incredibly dangerous and crazy, uh, this gain of function work. You quote Lord May, who's the former president of the Royal Society, is saying, the work they are doing is absolutely crazy. The whole thing is exceedingly dangerous. Yes, there is a danger, but it's not rising from the viruses out there and the animals. It's rising from the labs of grossly ambitious people. Yeah, I, I mean, it, I think specifically he was talking there about the work that was done in Holland and uh, the work that was done at the University of Wisconsin on the uh, making the bird flu um, more easily transmissible. Uh, but I think that that same um, charge applies to the work that we're seeing in Wuhan and the associated work in the United States uh, by these people who are incredibly well-funded. I mean, EcoHealth Alliance gets a lot of money from, corporati from corporations and from through the U.S. government and so on, and they are, uh, although they, they just recently got cut off um, uh, from some U.S. government funding, uh, but they, they had a, you know, a, a full spread in the New York Times basically saying, we're the solution. Fund us more. Um, I, I think grossly ambitious people um, fits the bill here. Who is Ron Fouchier? Sure. Uh, Ron Fouchier is a scientist in the Netherlands who used NIH uh, funding to make uh, the bird flu uh, more deadly, um, uh, to make it transmissible um, through the air. Um, and uh, this caused a furor, uh, or not a furor, but it got some notice in, the in uh, 2011 or so. Um, it was, uh, uh, you know, he. I believe that he outright said, you know, he proudly said that he's created the most deadly um, uh, pathogen yet. Um, and um, uh, a lot of people said that he shouldn't publish the results. 
um, uh, they eventually were published. Does this essentially provide some kind of a roadmap to people about how to make something like this? Right. He, he, w w the, 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 the work that he did um, w was using ferrets to uh, passage a virus through a series of ferrets, in this case the bird flu, uh, until it became transmissible by air so that it would mutate until it acquired that capacity and uh, would be able to infect humans. Um, so he made something that was deadly, far more transmissible, and therefore far, far deadlier. Um, and this caused some concern in various quarters, but not enough to actually, um, to actually stop this work from being done. He was, you know, Francis Boyle would call him and many of these other people death scientists. Who are Mark Lipsitch and Allison P. Galvani, and what did they write regarding Fouché's work in 2014? I, I can actually give you, I'll just give you this quote. We argue that the two main benefits claimed for these experiments, improved vaccine design and improved interpretation of surveillance, are unlikely to be achieved by the creation of potential pandemic pathogens, PPP, often termed gain-of-function experiments. Who are these guys and what were they trying to accomplish? They're um, uh, scientists at Yale and Harvard, and they uh, have been some of the people who are sometimes vocal on this issue and cautioning against this kind of uh, extremely dangerous uh, lab work. Um, I, I believe that I've seen some media by at least one of them since our current pandemic, but not on this issue. There's the loud crowd of people who are part of doing this dangerous work, and they're very loudly um, uh, denouncing any effort to scrutinize it. Um, but you have, I think, a lot of scientists who are very careful people for whatever reason, uh, either if they're cautious by nature or they, they don't want to um, go against where a lot of government funding is being done, and uh, they, they are remarkably quiet on this very question. So the, the, the media mantra that there's scientific consensus that this didn't come out of a lab is not true. A lot of the most prominent scientists, um, people who we talked about at Harvard and Yale, as well as, for example, Jonathan King at MIT, have been notably silent as to what the cause for the current pandemic is. And they, and, but prior to this, they had been sounding the warning. To some extent, it's periodic. It, the only person really sounding the warning on a regular basis is Francis Boyle. Um, uh, and to, to, to uh, uh, some extent, uh, Richard E. Bright and a few others. But a, a lot of these, you know, uh, names at more prestigious institutions for again, whatever reasons, have denounced the work in some set of circumstances, but not nearly as regularly, and less and less frequently as the years go by, whether that's because the field is changing because of the funding priorities as implemented by Fauci and others, or for other reasons, is somewhat speculative, but th th that, that's certainly the dynamic. Now, there have been uh, journalists who've covered this. Who, who is Allison Young and what was her beat? Allison Young worked at USA Today and from, uh, I believe, 2014 to 2017, she wrote a series of articles about uh, lab accidents um, uh, in the United States at the CDC, at how they are shrouded in secrecy, uh, at Tulane, uh, uh, at facilities in Tulane, um, I believe at Fort Detrick, at uh, dozens of facilities around the United States. She would go through the government report. She would do other investigative work. Um, it prompted some level of congressional inquiry at the time. She really performed a substantial uh, service. She's no longer on that beat. She stopped around 2017, um, and she's off doing something else now at some university and she's not, uh, I've touched base with her, but she's not, you know, doing anything on this. Who is Meryl Nass and what has is, what is her role been and what's her work been prior to this? Um, Meryl Nass, she, as far as I know, documented 
did the first work documenting a, a case of biowarfare uh, in recent decades. Uh, it involved uh, Rhodesia and the use of anthrax um, there by the white minority government or elements associated with it against black farmers. She's the first person who I heard from about the, um, the problems with the Nature Medicine article. She pointed out that it was an incredibly disingenuous article and there were a whole series of ways that, besides genetic engineering, that the current pandemic could have resulted. Um, and I've, that was shared with Richard Ebright at Rutgers and he said, yeah, <laughs> he totally backed that up and said, for example, you could do animal passage um, as, as they uh, did in Holland and the University uh, of Wisconsin. So we've been talking about gain of function and how that possibility has been minimized, but Luc Montagnier made a very startling claim recently. And, and if you could just tell us who Luc Montagnier is and what he discovered and, and what is he now suggesting is the case about the novel coronavirus. Luc Montagnier won the Nobel uh, Prize in Medicine uh, for um, uh, discovering the HIV virus. Um, and he recently has said that he believes that the current novel coronavirus is, bio is genetically engineered and that it has elements of HIV uh, and other um, uh, elements in it that are recognizable. This is remarkably similar to what Francis Boyle um, has been saying um, since Jan late January or early February. But Montagnier actually says he, he's looked at it. He says that he's looked at it. Um, I believe that he's basing some of his um, assessment on some work done by some Indian scientists who um, uh, you know, pulled back their work. Uh, he, he says that it was done for political reasons um, under pressure, uh, which also has been alleged about some Chinese scientists who uh, put out some uh, statements early on uh, saying that the lab in Wuhan was responsible. They, they also withdrew their statements. Uh, Montagnier says, I'm a Nobel winner. They can't intimidate me, and this is my assessment. I don't believe that he's published a, you know, a clear scientific paper as to uh, the methodology behind his assessment. And he's not saying it necessarily came from Wuhan. He's just saying, look, I've found HIV edited into this. Yes, that, that my understanding is that he is adamant in not drawing any kind of conclusions other than I believe that this was human, a human creation. How many uh, lab accidents did you run across? W was there a, a long list of them? There's a very long list of them. Uh, there, there was a paper, a version of which was published in the uh, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists in 2014 um, that went back in time. Um, lab accidents in England, um, uh, 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 foot and mouth disease, um, uh, other uh, that, that, that happened four kilometers away from a uh, biosafety lab. Uh, assorted other things that happened throughout the years and again through uh, the reporting of USA Today. We're, we're talking about hundreds of accidents. Uh, that, 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 we've, that we know about. That we know about. And, and the literature says that, that this could well be the tip of the iceberg. These are the things that get reported. These are the things that see the light of day. So we don't know what else is out there that has happened and that has been either ignored or hushed up. I mean, a lot of lab accidents, they might not even know. I mean, the, the lab accident in Wuhan, if it, it came out of a lab in, in Wuhan, it, it, the, the, they will, you know, it could just somebody didn't take quite the proper precaution they could have, and they wouldn't know that they made a mistake and somehow a pathogen got out of the lab. That's perfectly plausible. Um, is the answer given Th this the safety problems and given that their research seems to be spurring a, a, a kind of arms race, a biodefense, bioweapons arms race, and given that, you know, we are artificially accelerating dangers that we uh, might not ever need face, is, 
is your answer in looking at all this to to just to really dismantle these bio defense labs? I mean, is that is that where we as a people should what we should be agitating for? I think at minimum there should be a stop on the gain of function work. Um, uh, and, and there was a pause in funding from 2014 to 2017. It was lifted in 2017. Um, and that, but that was just a pause in funding. I think what needs to stop is the actual gain of function work, at least until a proper assessment is made. Um, and again, it presumably v violates the bioweapons convention. So th th those conventions need to have genuine teeth um, put into them. Um, now, I don't know what other portions of biodefense work are good and relevant. Um, I think that there needs to be a much broader inquiry about that. But at least in dealing with these potentially pandemic pathogens, what's euphemistically known as gain of function work, uh, I think that that work should be stopped. Um, uh, Francis Boyle would probably go further and say that people involved in that need to be prosecuted. Um, and, and, and I think a broader assessment needs to be done about wh what, 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 if any, elements of bio-defense bio work are legitimate. So once the cat is out of the bag, could you ever even stop, stuff it back in? You were talking about regulation, you were talking about we need to know more. But we could stop this all, theoretically say it has to stop, but people know how to do it. So can you ever really stop it? Well, it's funny that you say that because people used to talk about biological and chemical weapons as the examples of people having succeeded in putting the, the cat back in the bag. Um, and it seems that that didn't happen, um, that, that it just simply morphed into a whole set of pretexts. Um, so ultimately, the problems are qu questions of partially of science and partially of media and getting information out, but largely uh, of global governance, uh, of what meaningful implements you can use to um, to, to stop th these sorts of dynamics of th these governments um, uh, accelerating these weapons arms rights. And, and sometimes it's a mutually beneficial thing. I mean, when, when I got kicked out a, a, in Helsinki, my question was about the nuclear weapons ban treaty. This is a treaty backed by 122 countries. The group behind it won the Nobel Peace Prize. And there, Trump was never asked about it. To my knowledge, Putin was never asked about it about why are you stopping this? And they're stopping it because that's how they derive their power, by having these weapons. That's how the United States derives, the government derives a great deal of geopolitical power, and that's how Russia derives a great deal of geopolitical power. And so they enter into this dance of death that effectively you know, pushes down other people. And you could have a very similar dynamic now with uh, bioweapons. Okay, my final question. Given all the happy outcomes for state and monopoly power all over the world, including massive wealth transfer upwards, shuttering of small business, the repression of dissent, et cetera, et cetera, and given, I have to say, what appears to be the foreknowledge on display in oddly prescient international exercises like Event 201. <laughs> It began in healthy-looking pigs, months, perhaps years ago. A new coronavirus spread silently within herds. Infected people got a respiratory illness with symptoms ranging from mild flu-like signs to severe pneumonia. Governments need to be willing to do things that are out of their historical perspective. Or for the most part, it's, it's really a, a war footing that we need to be on. So at the moment, we want the funds, right? You need the money. So where's the money? But now you need a really coordinated, centralized mm -hmm. effort. Is it not probable that this virus was indeed, you know, I won't say use the word engineered, but was uh, released not necessarily by any one country, but really for the mutual benefit of powerful groups in every country? Um, uh, 
Whitney Webb, um, a journalist at Last American Vagabond, who her work, as well as other interesting work on this, has been either deplatformed or demonetized by the internet giants, has done some interesting work on this, laying out uh, that there were war games or some kind of preparatory games um, before the current pandemic that were eerily similar to um, uh, Dark Winter, uh, which was immediately before and foreshadowed the anthrax attacks in 2001. Um, I, I think uh, it's very difficult for me to assess probabilities in something like this. I think that what we do know is that a lot of very powerful institutions benefited tremendously from this pandemic. Um, and that a lot of agendas um, uh, around remaking society in various ways uh, benefited. This so-called social distancing, which shouldn't, you know, it's, it's physical distancing, presumably. Um, uh, but it's been a boon to internet companies, to other uh, powerful forces, to nationalistic forces. W you know, to some extent, they could be simply uh, fortune favors the prepared or that it was actually planned uh, by one or more, uh, 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 you know, interests, um, interests involved. Um, I, I think that it's disingenuous for people to say, as I've heard many people say, oh, this isn't what a bioweapon looks like, so um, that can't be right. Well, you don't know what a bioweapon looks like. It's something that hurts people and is used for strategic purpose. Are, are they that saying that because be. this is too weak somehow? This is, this is either too weak or too unpredictable. Um, and, and I mean, some of these things have merit. I mean, you know, Boris Johnson uh, allegedly got it. So you'd think that whoever <laughs> did this might have wanted to give him a heads up. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not seeing clear delineations on these issues, but I think that the, the notion that this is either too weak or uh, that it's too unpredictable and therefore it can't possibly be an intentionally created uh, bioweapon, I, I don't think that, that, you know, th 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 that that's a really rigorous statement. You don't know what the intended goals are of uh, a given bioweapon um, uh, until it, it benefits certain parties. Um, so I, I think that all three of those three options are still possible. And I, I would challenge people who want to dismiss this to go back and wonder why you didn't ask the questions about the anthrax attacks. Why didn't you ask the questions at the time? And why didn't you ask the questions as the so-called investigations, you know, went forward and Robert Mueller effectively had a hand in covering it up and then he's brought back to, to guide the direction of the Democratic Party for three years. There, there's such an insular clique of individuals involved in this and such a lack of scrutiny uh, by a lot of parties um, that, that I, 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 I seriously question attempts to dismiss such possibilities. What about, what's this whole idea about trying to blame nature for these things? What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that it's part of a, a whole search for enemies. You know, it's, it's Iraq is the problem. Al-Qaeda is the problem. Well, you created Al-Qaeda by funding the Mujahideen uh, to fight against the Soviets. Well, th this is the problem. Well, 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 you know, it's North Korea. It's, it's this and that. Well, North Korea voted for the nuclear weapons ban treaty. You voted against it. Um, there's a search for enemies, and in, in, in some respects, the the, the 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 final enemy is nature, of saying, it's these or culture, you know, that the, the, the it's these weird people eating weird meats, and that therefore that's the problem, or, you know, nature, and we have to control nature, you know, the, that it has to succumb to our will, that views humanity not as a creation of nature that needs to play off of it and build off of it uh, and, and learn from it uh, and work in harmony with it, but rather needs to control and manipulate it uh, for uh, geostrategic, for profit, for gain, uh, for things and only maybe tangentially for genuine benefit of humanity.